Salam alaikum. Did you know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert? It specialized in geology, meteorology, oceanology, and physics. Don't be shocked, because this will be the only explanation that the atheists and the Christians will come up with at the end of that video, if they still insist on rejecting God altogether. I will go through 18 miracles in the Quran in these fields. And then you will have to decide if this information is from God in a form of a revelation to his prophet or did Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him had a secret research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century. So get ready, bring your coffee and let's start. Allah described mountains in the Quran in two very interesting ways. The first one was in Surah Al-Anbiya. وَجَعَلْنَا فِي الْأَرْضِ رَوَاسِيَ أَن تَمِيدَ بِهِمْ I have made mountains as anchors to prevent the land from moving, to stabilize the land. If you're not familiar with anchors, anchors are these heavy pieces of metal that look like this. When a ship wants to stay stationary, it throws this anchor deep down in the water to prevent the ship from moving randomly. Allah is saying that mountains are going deep down and they prevent the land under you from moving randomly. The same way anchors go down to prevent ships from moving. The second description was in Surah An-Naba. Waljibala awtada. Mountains are pegs. A peg is something that looks like a big nail that we use to hold tents on the ground. Without this peg, the air can blow the tent away. This peg has a small part above the ground, but most of it should be underground. Allah is saying that mountains are similar to pegs. A small part of it is above the ground and the big part is underground. They go deep like pegs to keep the land from moving, to stabilize the land. Now, imagine living in the 7th century, you would say something like, what is this man talking about? How does he know what is under the mountains? It's impossible for him to know that, and it's impossible for anyone to confirm or deny. Fast forward to modern technology. Let's see what we discovered. This is Professor Frank Press, the science advisor to the former US President Jimmy Carter and the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Washington, D.C. He explained in his book the underlying structure of the mountains as follows. This part is the part of the mountain that we can see. And this part is the rest of the mountain that we can't see. This is another picture that shows the scale. This part is the mountain we see, and this part is the rest of the mountain that we can't see. For example, the height of Mount Everest is about 9 kilometers, more or less. But its route goes down 140 kilometers. See the difference? 9 above the ground, 140 under the ground. If it wasn't for this structure of the mountains, the Earth's crust would be moving randomly and repeatedly, and it will be unlivable. You can also read this article, titled Mountains Gravitational Pegs Stabilize the Earth's Rotation Motion. It will give you all the information you need to fully understand this scientific discovery. After you finish reading it, ask yourself, how did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, know that in the 7th century? Did he have a secret scientific research center or did he secretly take an axe and dig a very, very, very deep hole, like 100 kilometer hole, next to a mountain to discover its internal structure and its function to stabilize the Earth's surface? Well, let's see. Let's Google together what is the deepest humans can dig. According to CNN, the deepest hole ever made by humans was the Kola Superdeep Borehole. It was in Northwest Russia, a Soviet-era scientific drilling project that took 20 years to complete and went down what? Went down 
12 kilometers only. That is 20 years using the technology of the Soviet Union in the modern era. And in the end, they only got deep 12 kilometers. So did the Prophet alone, secretly, without anyone notice, dig down 140 kilometers to discover the function of the mountains and its internal structure? And even if he did that, how did he keep that huge project a secret from everybody? Or did he just receive revelation from God, the creator of the mountains and everything else? And yes, I hear you. Before you write in the comments, a lot of people will start arguing. They will say maybe other nations before the prophet believed that the mountains had deep roots. And the prophet took this information from them. Okay, let's see. You might think that in the 7th century in Arabia, people argued about what is beneath the land they were living on. And they had different theories and different beliefs and, you know, there was a discussion. But actually, that is completely wrong. People had one belief that the earth was floating above unlimited water, infinite water. We demonstrated that already with evidence and references in our last video, the Prophet Space Agency. If you missed it, you missed a lot. You have to go back and see it. I will leave a link to it in the description. But anyway, I will add to these references one more. We all know the famous story of Jonah being swallowed by the whale and living inside the stomach of the fish. There is a very interesting verse in the middle of that story in the Bible. Psalms 24 The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Until now, it's fine. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the water. Earth was founded on the seas, established on the water. Let's see, Jonatu. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. This is Jonah talking. The earth beneath bared me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up. Seems like the author of the Bible had a completely different imagination of what is underneath us. Let's demonstrate it together so we can imagine. This is the land and this is a mountain. And this is the mountain root. The Bible claims that Prophet Jonah went down inside the belly of the fish and the fish swam in the unlimited water under the earth until he reached to the mountain root. Let's read it again. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. So how can you reach the roots of the mountain? You will have to go first in this line in the sea. And then when you go deep enough, you can turn and then go under the earth until you reach the root of the mountain. That was a common belief back then. And the description in the Quran is the exact opposite. And it came to challenge the common belief of the people in the 7th century. It came in the middle of all of that ignorance. So now you have to ask yourself, is there any other explanation for this other than believing that the Quran is the words of God? Ask yourself, is it a possibility that he had a secret scientific research in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? And finally, ask yourself, is it rational to still believe in the Bible until today? And reject the words of God in the Quran? It doesn't take much effort for a sincere person to find the truth. After reading about the mountain structure, normally the next question that comes to mind would be something like that. If the Quran is saying the claims in the Bible and common knowledge in the 7th century about earth being above water, all of that is false. The earth is not above unlimited water, right? Then what is beneath us? Because the moment you reject the whole theory, you will have to provide a complete alternative theory, right? So according to the Quran, what is under the surface of the earth? And the answer is in Surah Al-Mulk. If Allah orders the earth to swallow you deep inside it, you will find it swaying. 
The word sway is never used to describe a liquid or a solid. It is used to describe something in the middle. Something that can barely move, like something that has a very, very high viscosity. The only thing that we know that fits that description is molten rocks and metals. Disbelievers back then could not prove or deny this information in the Quran, as there was no way for anyone to have the technology to understand what is under the crust or to dig a very, very, very deep hole and check with his own eyes. So throughout history, Muslims just believed it as it is, because God said so. However, after 1,400 years, thanks to modern technology, finally, we can establish that as a fact. Turns out the information in the Quran was correct, and every other claim or common belief or the information provided in the Bible, turns out it was wrong. There is no unlimited water under the earth. It may sound like common sense to you now, but that is because our advancement in knowledge and in science, and that is because you got taught that in schools. However, people back then could not wrap their heads around the new concept introduced by the Quran. They believed in the Bible story and they used the fact that when they dig down, they find water, they make wells. This is how they drink. So to them, yeah, see, proof. Every time we dig down, we make a well, we find water. Therefore, the story in the Bible of the unlimited water under the earth is correct. This is what they thought. And in the end, Quran was correct. So now you ask yourself, did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, know that information from the one who created earth and everything else? Or did he have a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Allah provides very interesting information about the deep ocean in Surah An-Nur. If a man were to dive down in the very, very deep ocean, he would find himself in complete darkness. Darkness to the extent that even if he puts his hand in front of his face, he can't even see it. Someone might ask, wasn't that common knowledge anyway? And the answer is absolutely not. Assuming you are one of the professional divers in the 7th century, you might be able to dive down 40 meters, 50 meters. Remember, we are talking before modern diving equipment and oxygen tanks. You're diving without oxygen. You will have to hold your breath to dive deep as much as you can. In that depth, you can't really experience any change in the intensity of the brightness of the sunlight, as the change is very, very, very small and unnoticeable to the human eye. The world record for free diving is currently held by Arnold Gerald, who dived to the depth of 122 meters in 2023. That was, of course, after a lifetime of training and experience. Even that is not enough. In order for you to experience the darkness of the ocean we're talking about, you really need a submarine. Because this area of the ocean that is completely dark is more than 1,000 meters deep. Imagine you walk off the coast into the water. At 10 meters, or 33 feet deep, you're already experiencing an entire additional atmosphere of pressure. At 214 meters, you're passing the verified record for a human diver with no equipment. At 830, you're the depth of the tallest building on Earth. And at 1,000 meters down, no light from the surface is getting to you anymore. Now ask yourself, can a man in the middle of the desert, who had no access to oceans or seas to begin with, who could not read or write, know that information? Did Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, know that because he was a prophet or because he had a secret submarine? Wait a minute. First you said there is molten rock under the earth crust. Then you said oceans are so deep and it's dark down there. What happens if the ocean is deep enough so that the ocean water becomes so close to this extremely hot molten rock? 
What happens at this meeting point between fire and water? Allah says in Surah An-Nur, وَالْبَحْرِ الْمَسْجُورِ I swear by the seas set on fire. The word masjur literally translates to on fire. For example, Sajar Allah al kafir Allah burnt the disbeliever in hellfire. Seas on fire in the Quran, where are they? And fire and water don't mix, right? A lot of early Muslims could not understand this oath, as they could not find any sea that is set on fire. So they interpreted it as something that will happen maybe in the hereafter. They couldn't really explain it. Even though the context of the verses themselves are not talking about the hereafter. But they simply didn't have any other way to interpret it. Because there is no sea on fire. However, using modern technology, we could finally find them. Check out this report from CNN. There's one thing you need to know about the Ring of Fire. It produces 90% of the world's earthquakes. Many of them are submarine volcanoes, meaning they're underwater, as are 75% of the world's volcanoes in total. 70% of the world's volcanoes are underwater. The name of the phenomena is called Ring of Fire Underwater Fire. Walbahr al-Masjur. I swear by the seas on fire. This phenomena happens at the meeting point between the deep dark ocean and the molten rock layer under the earth crust. Now it's time to ask yourself, did the prophet peace and blessing be upon him? Know that because he was a prophet or because he had a secret submarine. Allah says in Surah An-Nur, أو كظلمات في بحر اللجي يغشاه موج من فوقه موج من فوقه سحاب. If you are in the deep dark ocean, above you there will be three layers. The first one is a layer of waves. Above it there is another layer of waves. Above it there is a layer of clouds. Okay. That is a total of two layers of waves and one layer of clouds. But wait a minute, we can only see one layer of waves and one layer of clouds. Where is the second layer of waves? For more than a thousand years, Islamophobes mocked Muslims for believing in a second layer of waves deep down in the ocean. Muslims had no scientific proof for its existence, but they believed in it anyway because it is in the Quran. Well, until modern science solved the issue. Check out this article in the Washington Post. Gigantic underwater waves explained for the first time. If you scroll down a little, we can see the satellite images of these internal waves. You can also check this article in NASA's website. Waves above and below the water. Large waves that propagate below the water surface within the depth of the sea. Now you have to ask yourself the same question. Did he know that because he was a prophet? Or because he had a secret submarine in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? It really doesn't take much effort for a sincere person to find the truth about God. Remember when we talked in the Prophet's Time Machine video about how the Prophet correctly predicted the defeat of the Romans? If you missed it, you missed a lot. Make sure you check it out. I will leave a link to it in the description under the video. Anyway, there is something very, very interesting in the same verse. Let's read it together. The Romans were defeated in the lowest land. The key word here is Adna. This word literally means lowest, as in al kiraa ma dun al rukba, or in wa min dunhi ma jannatan in Surah Al Rahman. And below these two gardens will be two others. The problem for early Muslims was that they couldn't prove that this specific piece of land was really the lowest land on earth. Some of them even started interpreting it as the nearest land, maybe. 
And this interpretation was very far from the meaning. It doesn't even fit. As it wasn't the nearest land, there were other lands which are nearer to the place of the revelation. So this case was still open until modern science solved the mystery. Alhamdulillah. If you check this article, you will find out that this specific piece of land where the Romans were defeated, this land near the Dead Sea, is the world's lowest place on earth, with an elevation that is more than 400 meters below sea level. Subhanallah. Now the question is to you. Did he know that because he was a prophet? Or because he had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? It really doesn't take much effort for a sincere person to find the truth about God. Before I continue, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, this information will be very, very helpful to people seeking the truth or seeking to strengthen their faith. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, whoever leads to good is like the one who does it. Help this video spread, first by engaging with it. Put a like, put a comment there. If you don't have anything to write in the comment, just write SubhanAllah. Then share it on your social media account. This way, you share the reward with us, inshallah. Thank you. In the 7th century, as you would expect, people had no idea about the formation and the structure of the clouds. They know rain comes from them, but no further details. However, the Bible had some weird claims. For example, in Job 26.8, he pours water into cumulus cloud bags, and the bags don't burst. This is from the Bible Study Tools website. In other translations, it says, he wraps up the water in his clouds, and the clouds does not burst under them. I will not tell you myself what does that mean, because you might not believe me, so I will read it for you from the official commentary itself. For example, Gill's exposition. The description here is very clear. As anything bound up in a sack, or a bag, or a garment, or the skirt of a man's coat. Seems like the cloud is a plastic bag, or a balloon, filled with water. And this bag is waiting to be burst. The moment it burst, we get the rain. At the time when people had these weird understandings of the world around them, Allah revealed in the Quran, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُزْجِي سَحَابًا ثُمَّ يُؤَلِّفُ بَيْنَهُ ثُمَّ يَجْعَلُهُ رُكَامًا فَتَرَ الْوَضَقَ يَخْرُجُ مِنْ خِلَالِهِ Can't you see that Allah causes the pieces of cloud to join together? Then he causes them to pile up into big masses. And then you see rain coming down. This is word by word from Tafsir al-Sa'di. A cloud is not a big plastic bag that carries water inside and bursts open. A cloud is a formation of a lot of mini cloud pieces piled up. Now let's see the same description exactly from National Geographic which results in the formation of tiny globules called cloud droplets, much smaller than raindrops. Cloud droplets are extremely light and a mass while they are float, mixing with the air to form the fluffy formations we see suspended in the sky. Did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, copy the description of the formation of the cloud from National Geographic? Or did he have his own secret research center? in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Or did he receive this amazing Quran from the one who created the clouds and the rain and everything else? It doesn't take much effort for a sincere person to find the truth about God. Another very interesting information about the clouds was also revealed in the same verse. وَيُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ جِبَالٍ فِيهَا مِنْ بَرَدٍ فَيُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ And he sends down from the sky mountains loaded with hail, pouring it on whoever he wills, and averting it from whoever he wills. 
In this verse, Allah describes the shape of the clouds with the word mountains. This was unclear to Muslims from the 7th century up until the invention of aeroplanes. Only now we can see with our own eyes the real shape of the clouds from above. For example, this is a picture of a cloud and this is a picture of a mountain. Again, this is a picture of a cloud from above and this is a picture of a mountain from above. Cloud, mount. This cloud that has the same formation of a mountain, it is called cumulonimbus cloud. They even refer to it in weather forecast education as the cloud that looks like huge mountains or towers. And its weather prediction is what? Look out for rain, hail, and tornadoes. وَيُنزِلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ جِبَالٍ فِيهَا مِنْ بَرَدْ فَيُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءٍ And he sends down from the sky mountains loaded with hail, pouring it on whoever he wills, and averting it from whoever he wills. The flash of the cloud's lightning nearly takes away eyesight. The verse in the Quran describing a cloud that looks like a mountain also mentions hail, lightning, bad weather, and the weather forecast signs that refer to the same specific cloud that looks like a mountain also predicts bad weather with this cloud. What is also impressive about the parallel between the shape of a cloud and the shape of a mountain is the height. The height of this cloud from its bottom to its top is very similar to a mountain. For example, this article says, such monsters can grow up to 15 to 18 kilometers in height. The question is, did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, know all of that information because he had a secret aeroplane? Or did he receive this amazing Quran from the one who created the clouds and everything else? You choose. Allah provided more information about the clouds in Surah Al-A'raf. حتى إذا أقلت سحابا ثقالا سقناه إلى بلد ميت فأنزلنا به الماء. He is the one who causes the wind to carry heavy clouds. Also in Surah Al-Rad, وينشئ السحاب الثقال. He is the one who creates the heavy clouds. Wait a minute. I thought a cloud is like a fluffy cotton candy. Why does Allah call it heavy? Well, we couldn't really understand why Allah refers to clouds as heavy for more than a thousand years. Until finally, this happened. Clouds may look like giant balls of soft cotton floating in the sky, but they are not as light as you may think. In fact, the average cumulus cloud weighs approximately 1.1 million pounds, about as much as 100 elephants. What? According to the official government website of USGS, it weighs about 500,000 kilograms or 1.1 million pounds. But that heavy cloud is floating over your head because the air below it is even heavier. وَيُنْشِئُ السَّحَابَ الثِّقَالِ He is the one who creates the heavy clouds. Now you tell me, how did a desert Bedouin Arab who couldn't read or write in the 7th century come up with all of this scientific information? Did he have a secret scientific research center or did he receive this from the one who created the clouds and everything else? One last thing about the clouds before we change the subject. Remember when we established the common belief in the 7th century about the clouds being bags holding water inside them waiting to burst open? That is a separation between the cloud and the water. The cloud is the container and the water is inside it. Allah responded to that in Surah An-Nur. وَيُنَزِّلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ جِبَالٍ He sends down the mountains, i.e. the clouds. The verse describes the cloud itself as being sent down in a form of rain, not a cloud as a bag holding the rain inside it. No, the cloud itself is the rain that is being sent down. 
And of course, I don't need to provide any modern scientific reference for that, as we all already learned the water cycle in school, and we understand that the cloud itself is the rain. So the question still stands. Did he know that because he had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert of the 7th century? Or did he know that because he received revelation from the one who created rain and everything? Lately we started seeing in the market high speed cameras, like this one for example. Don't ask about the price by the way. These cameras helped us observe things that were happening extremely fast, to the extent that it was impossible to observe with the naked eye. But if you record it with a very very high FPS, you can show it later on a screen using slow motion. That led the way to a lot of new discoveries. One of them was the movement of lightning. Turns out, the lightning does not just appear and disappear in front of our eyes. No. Actually, it moves. This is how we saw lightning in normal real life speed. And this is how we can see the lightning in slow motion. See the difference? Real life speed, slow motion. Most of this process happens way too fast for the human eye to discern. What we and most of our normal video cameras can see is just the bright return stroke phase of lightning. But modern high-speed video cameras can show the progression of lightning leaders in vivid detail. That triggered our curiosity to make more studies about the lightning. There was a huge debate on the direction of the movement of the lightning. Does it move up? Does it move down? And finally, we got our answer. Actually, it's both. According to the official website of NSSL, does lightning strike from the sky down or the ground up? The answer is both. Cloud to ground lightning comes from the sky down, but the part you see comes from the ground up. Also, according to the official website of NOAA, step number one, lightning strike initiates. Step number two, Leader approaches the ground. This is the lightning moving down. Step number three, leader connect. Step number four, return stroke shoots up. To sum up all of these modern discoveries, lightning moves down and then up again after that. Imagine a man in the middle of the desert where there were rarely any humidity or rain, where there were no signs, no slow motion cameras, in the 7th century, telling everyone that lightning moves down then up again. Yes, you heard it correctly. According to this authentic hadith, Al-Barq yamurru thumma yarja' fi tarfati ayn. Thunder comes down then back up again in a blink of an eye. If you still don't want to believe he was a prophet who learned all that from the one who created lightning and everything else, then you explain to me, how can a man in the middle of the desert, 1400 years ago, know this information about a natural phenomena that can't be seen by the naked eye. And that rarely happens anyway in a dry place like the Arabian desert. It doesn't take much effort for a sincere person to find the truth about God. One of the very interesting recent discoveries in modern science is something that happens every morning. Let me explain it first. Step 1. After sunrise, the heat from the sun heats the surface of the earth. Step 2. Air that is close to the surface of the earth also heats up. Step 3. This air expands because of the heat and thus becomes less dense than cool air at higher altitudes. Step 4. The hot air rises up and the cool air moves down. This amazing phenomena replaces the air that we polluted yesterday, that is close to the surface of the earth, with fresh clean air from high altitudes. This is an amazing blessing from God for which we don't thank Him. Anyway, to sum up this phenomena, it looks like the surface of the earth is taking in fresh air and pushing away the old air from yesterday that happens every morning. 
And that is exactly what happens when we are breathing. We take in fresh air and we push away old air. So, to make sure you don't forget this amazing phenomena, call it morning breathing. Now, let's go back 1,400 years ago to a man called Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. When he was telling his companions about a revelation he received from God. I swear by the night when it goes away and by the morning when it breathes. I swear by the night when it goes away and by the morning when it breathes that indeed this Quran is the word of God delivered by a noble angel to the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him. Will you believe this Quran is the words of God himself or will you claim that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? It doesn't take much effort for a sincere person to find the truth. We haven't talked about the Bible for a while. How about we go back and read a little bit? Remember when we discussed the conception of the earth and the heavens in the Bible? If you missed it, make sure you watch our last video, The Prophet's Space Agency. Anyway, one of the claims that the Bible made was a widespread belief in the 7th century, and that was the time of the revelation of the Quran. The belief was that the mountains are the pillars of heaven. Yes, you heard it correctly, pillars, like columns, like the pillars you have in your house that is holding your roof. If you remove the mountains, the sky will literally fall on us. Don't laugh, it was hard back then to get a clear idea about the universe without technology. For example, 2 Samuel 22. The earth trembled and shook, the pillars of the heavens rocked back and forth. Also in Job 26, the pillars of heaven trembled and are astonished at his reproof. The question is, what are the pillars of heaven in these verses? Because a lot of you will tell me, see, it doesn't say mountains, you're lying, blah, blah, blah. Let's read from the official commentaries. According to Benson commentary, perhaps the mountains, which by their height and strength seem to reach and support the heavens. According to Cambridge Bible for school and colleges, the lofty mountains on which the heavens seem to rest. According to pulpit commentary, the pillars of heavens are the mountains on which the sky seems to rest. According to Berna's notes, the pillars of heaven tremble, that is the mountains which seem to bear up the heavens. So among the ancients, Mount Atlas was represented as one of the pillars of heavens. Virgil speaks of Atlas, whose brawly back supports the skies. See, it's not my interpretation of the Bible. In the middle of all of that ignorance, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, delivered to us the revelation of Surat al Ra'd. Allahu alladhi rafa'a samawati bi ghayri amadin tarawnaha. Allah is the one who raised the heavens without pillars. For early Muslims, they had to go against the common belief of that time. They had to reject any idea about the mountains being the pillars of heaven because Allah said the opposite in the Quran. It was very hard for them back then to stick to their belief. But after the advancement of modern science, we can see how the Quran corrected a scientific mistake in the Bible 1000 years before humanity could discover that mistake on their own. So now you tell me, did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, know that because he had a secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Or did he know that from the one who created the heavens, the mountains and everything? And is it rational today to still believe in the Bible and reject the Quran? Does that make sense to you? Is it rational to still believe that the mountains are holding the sky up from falling on us? If anyone insists in disbelief after all this, then he only has himself to blame. Before we continue, let me remind you once more. 
This information might be an eye-opener to someone who is in desperate need of guidance. Someone who is sincerely looking for God. Do not miss your opportunity to share the reward with us by helping the video spread as much as possible. You also have our permission to download this video and upload it to your own channel, to whatever social media you want, even on YouTube, no problem, it's copyright free. Thanks for your help and let's continue. If you are familiar with the Quran, I would assume that you already know that God sometimes communicates extra information to us using word repetition. For example, the word punishment is repeated 117 times, while the word forgiveness is repeated exactly the double, 234 times. So, forgiveness is double the punishment. The word they said is repeated 332 times, while the word say or prophet is repeated also 332 times. So, for every claim from the disbelievers, there is a response. This life is repeated 115 times. The hereafter is also 115 times. Devil 88 times. Angel also 88 times. Paradise 77 times. Hell 77 times. Zakah, the obligatory charity, is repeated 32 times. And blessing is also repeated 32 times. See the connection? Richness 26 times, while poverty is half of that, 13 times. Woman 23 times, and man also 23 times. By the way, you might think that woman and man both are repeated 23 times. That is to emphasize that women are equal to men. But yes, but that's not all. There is also something very, very nice. Normally, every human has 46 chromosomes. 23 from the mother, the woman, and 23 from the father, the man. Mm, anyway, what I need to focus on right now is the words land and sea. The word land is repeated 13 times, while the word sea is repeated 32 times. That is not equal or double or half or anything that we experienced before. What are this weird number? What do you think this is referring to? If you already know, write it down for me before I say it. You know what? I will try to make it easy for you. 13 and 32, the total of them is 45. So, the percentage of land repetition to the total, land and sea, is 13 over 45, which is 29%. And the C repetition of the total land and C is 32 divided by 45, which is 71%. Did you guess what these numbers represent? Last chance, write it down before I say. Okay. Water makes up 71% of the Earth's surface while land makes 29%. Continents, islands, everything. I swear, it doesn't take much effort for a sincere person to believe in this Quran and to find the truth about God. Arabs in Mecca and Medina in the 7th century lived in a desert. This desert had no access to any river or sea or ocean. In that environment, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him read for them a revelation sent to him from God, talking about a phenomena that they never heard about in their lives. Surah Al-Furqan وَهَوَ الَّذِي مَرَجَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ هَذَا عَذْبٌ فُرَاتٌ وَهَذَا مِلْحٌ أُجَاجٌ وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَهُمَا بَرْزَخًا وَحِجْرًا مَحْجُورًا and he is the one who merged two bodies of water, one fresh and palatable, and the other is salty and bitter. However, they do not overcome one another. Although both waters meet together, each one keeps its distinctive qualities. The river does not become salty, and the reverse also doesn't happen. Also, Surah Ar-Rahman, Maraj al-Bahrayni yaltaqiyan. God causes two bodies of water to meet. However, there is a barrier between them which they don't cross. 
But else in the desert didn't really understand what is that, and where, and how. Likewise, I, until now, didn't witness that phenomena with my eyes. Neither most of you. But we are lucky enough to have the privilege to see it on YouTube. So let's watch it together. Here is the meeting point between a fresh and salty water. And here is the meeting point between two oceans. The difference between two waters in density creates a barrier between them, preventing them from losing their distinctive qualities. The question is, how did he know that he lived in a place that only had water that comes from wells in the middle of the desert, in a place where there were no YouTube or libraries or anything, in the 7th century? Any explanations other than he knew that from the one who created rivers, oceans, and everything else? I don't think so. Another phenomena that God talked about in the Quran was in Surah at tariq Wal ardi dati sada. And by the earth which has its own crack. Arabs in the middle of the desert in the 7th century, of course, didn't understand what is that and where is it? Where is that crack? Likewise, I until now didn't witness that phenomena with my own eyes. Neither did most of you. But we are lucky enough to live in the era of modern science. Only now we have the privilege of seeing it. Lately, we have been discovering cracks like this one. A massive crack in the ground that's estimated to be up to 50 feet deep has opened up in Kenya seemingly overnight. The crack stretches along Kenya's Great Rift Valley, and many scientists believe it could end up splitting the continent apart. Deborah Pata is tracking developments from Johannesburg, South Africa. The crack in Kenya sits along the 3,700-mile-long East African Rift. Geologists say that rift is growing larger as two tectonic plates move away from each other. And also, like this one. The earth has literally ripped itself apart. 16 feet wide and 25 feet deep, the gaping chasm has devastated everything in its path, including farmland and the link road to Highway 26. August 16, 2014. A drone capturing images in Hermosillo, northwest Mexico, reveals shocking footage of a crack in the earth that seems to have appeared overnight. And like this one. Another really good way to visualize the fault and how its lateral movement has affected the geology is at a place called Wallace Creek. Over 3,800 years ago, this now dried up creek transversed the San Andreas Fault in a straight line. But as the Pacific Plate shifted over the years, the direction of the creek changed. It's now offset 420 feet along the fault line. Scientists studied this phenomena and gave us a very good understanding on how these cracks are formed with the movement of the tectonic plates. And thus, where to expect them? They discovered the magnificent network of deep fault systems that encircles the globes for tens of thousands of kilometers in all directions. What is interesting is without this deep fault system, the Earth could not possibly have been inhabitable. That is simply because of the fact that it is through such deep faults that the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere have been created and are constantly rejuvenated. The question is to you now. How come a man in the Arabian desert who could not read or write 1400 years ago talk about that phenomenon? Did he have a secret scientific research center, or did he receive a revelation from the one who created the earth, its fault lines, and everything else? Does it really take much effort for a sincere person to find the truth? Have you ever wondered why a flame has different colors? As you can see here, the bottom of the flame is blue and the top is orange. And using a stronger lighter, we get more blue fire and less orange. I always wondered, like, why? Until science helped us understand. 
turns out, as the object absorbs heat, the atoms in the material gain energy, and they start vibrating more rapidly. This increased vibration causes the atoms to emit light at different wavelengths, which can result in a change in the object's color. So, according to target fire, for example, 500 to 1000 degrees, we get red flames. More than 1000, we get orange flames. Extremely hot fire, more than 2500, we get blue flames. So, going back to our lighter example. The bottom part of the flame is the hottest part. Thus, we see it blue. As the material goes up, it cools down, turning it from extremely hot blue to just hot yellow. Now, let's talk about the interesting part. What if, theoretically, we have enough energy to heat up the same material to unprecedented temperatures? Temperatures that is much, much higher than anything we experienced before. What do you think will happen to its color? If you know, write me down in the comments before I say it. It's very simple, actually. These are the wavelengths. The flame will start red. Then it will heat up more. It will become yellow. Then blue. Then at extreme heat, it will be violet. But if we keep going and heat it more and more and more, it will produce light that is outside of the visible light spectrum. To our eyes, it will be pitch black. And we all know that hellfire is nothing like the fire of this life. It's much, 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 much higher in temperature than anything in the universe. According to this authentic hadith, if you ignite all the fuel in the universe together, at the same place, at the same time, the amount of heat that will be produced will be nothing compared to the excruciating heat of hellfire. So based on that, we should expect the color of hellfire to be pitch black, right? Allah says in Surah Al-Mursalat, إِنَّهَا تَرْمِي بِشَرَرٍ كَالْقَصْرِ كَأَنَّهُ جُمَالَةٌ صُفْرِ Indeed, hellfire throws sparks as big as a huge castle. And it is pitch black like black camels. Woe on that day to the deniers. And Allah said in Surah Yunus, كَأَنَّمَا أُغْشِيَتْ وُجُوهُهُمْ قِطَعًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مُظْلِمًا those in hellfire will think that their eyes turned blind because they are being surrounded with patches of night's deep darkness. Darkness upon darkness. So the question is, did the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, get this information from his secret scientific research center in the middle of the desert in the 7th century? Or did he get it from the one who created heat, fire, science, and everything else. The last verse I want to discuss today is the one in Surah Al-Ra'at. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّا نَأْتِي الْأَرْضَ نَنْقُصُهَا مِنْ أَطْرَافِهَا Don't they see that I gradually reduce the earth from its borders? Of course, like every phenomena the Quran talked about, Arabs in the 7th century could not see or imagine it. How can Bedouins in the desert 1,400 years ago have the means to research something as complicated as that? So the question still remained, how does God gradually reduce the earth? What can be the meaning of that? Well, according to astronomy.com, Earth loses 3 kilograms of mass per second. That works out to adjust a tad more than 100 billion metric tons per year. When you compare that to the estimated mass of meteoroic material that falls on Earth every year, approximately 50,000 tons, indeed our planet does seem to be on a weight loss program. Earth is doing diet. And this article talks about the same phenomena. Earth loses 50,000 metric tons of mass every year. You can read it for more details. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّا نَأْتِي الْأَرْضَ نَنْقُصُهَا مِنْ أَطْرَافِهَا Don't they see that I gradually 
reduce the earth from its borders. Allah decides and none can reverse his decision and he is swift in reckoning. If you are sincere in your quest for the truth about God, I think you already found it. If you don't want to find it, nothing will ever convince you. Just remember that there is no one who will benefit from your belief and no one will lose anything from your disbelief. It's your life and it's your choice that will make you end up forever in paradise or forever in hellfire, the pitch black hellfire. My advice is you shouldn't take that risk and let your arrogance blind you. Allah said in Surah Fussilat, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ We will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that this Quran is the truth. If you want more information about what we talked about in this video, write me in the comments or you know what, join our Discord server and let's have a real conversation. The link is in the description. And remember, brothers and sisters, that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, deliver my message even if all you can deliver is one verse. So. Don't let this video stop with you, help it spread by engaging with it with a like and a comment and then share it on your social media accounts. And if you want to watch more evidence of Islam videos and more miracles of the Quran and Sunnah, check out this playlist. I am sure you will love it. Thanks and Salaam Alaikum. <laughs> إلا أصحاب اليمين في جنات يتساءلون عن المجرمين ما سلككم في سقر قالوا لم نك من المصلين ولم نكن طعم المسكين وكنا نخوض مع الخائضين وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين حتى أتانا اليقين فما فَعُهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ أَمَا لَهُمْ عَنِ التَّذْكِرَةِ مُعْرِضِينَ كَأَنَّهُمْ حُمُرٌ مُسْتَنْفِرَةٌ فَرَّتْ مِنْ قَسْوَرَةٌ بَلْ يُرِيدُ كُلُّ مِنْ مِنْهُمْ أَنْ يُؤْتَى صُحُفًا مُنَشَّرَةٌ كلا بل لا يخافون الآخرة كلا إنه تذكرة فمن شاء ذكرة وما يذكرون إلا أن يشاء Fira.